Now, you're not going to get entertained night with a drawing, and I don't know why the choir picked the only night to come down when there wasn't going to be a drawing, but there you are, and they're not going to be a drawing tonight or tomorrow night. Tonight, we're just going to have a little Bible study, and it's going to be kind of dull for some of you. If you don't like the manna, it's going to be kind of dull. <laughs> and if you long for the leeks and the onions and the garlic, well, I won't be too interested. But if you love the Lord and love the Word, you get a blessing. And I'm going to show you some things about your Bible tonight that you don't have to learn in any school, and I didn't learn in any school anyway. If I'm kind of uh, out in left field of my Bible approach, it's because the Lord got me there by myself. And I'm going to show you some things tonight about a King James Bible that maybe you didn't know might be a blessing to you. And then tomorrow night we're going to run all the references on tongues. Now, there's a movement sweeping this country, uh, charismatic, uh, glossy, all of this and that and other thing. And a bunch of folks talking what they call tongues, and we'll see what they are tomorrow night. And we'll run all the references in Acts and Corinthians on them. All right, now we can start almost anywhere here, but let's start in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. You can't turn to the uh, pastures in time, write them down, and look them up on your own, because we're going to go. We're going to move. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. If you're saved, this book will work in you. It'll only work effectually in you if you believe it. If you don't believe it, it won't work in you. The right. Bible said, when you heard it, you receive it not as the word of men, but as the word of God, and it effectually works in a man that believes. Take your Bible and turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Hebrews 4, verse 12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing of sunder of soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. I don't discern its thoughts and intents. It discerns mine. That book is perfectly capable of judging any college professor in this town. Now, that book is perfectly capable of taking apart and critiquing and dissecting anything you ever heard, anything you ever read, anything you ever learned. Verse 13, neither is there any creature, that takes care of you and your mother and your professor, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, his sight, well, who's the him? Verse 12, the word of God, he talked about that word like it was a person, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, the word of God. You say, well, it's Christ. No, you're wrong. When he said the word of God is quick and powerful and sharp than any two-edged sword, it's not referring to Jesus, because when Jesus comes back in Revelation chapter 19, he opens his mouth and a sharp two-edged sword goes out of his mouth. It's not the incarnate word, it's the written word. Amen. The word of God is quick and powerful and nothing is hid from his sight. This book has personality. It's like a person. The fellow said, you got a paper pope, fellow told me one time. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's all right. At least I got one that's infallible and sinless. That's more than you got. <laughs> you know, one time a fellow found a fanatic out there in the streets of New York running around a hat, you know. He's pointing at the hat in the middle of the road and saying, it's alive, it's alive, it's alive, it's alive. And a whole crowd gathered around there thought he was nuts. And he kept running around the hat saying, it's alive, it's alive. And they kept saying, what's alive, what's alive? And he went over and picked up that hat and there was a Bible underneath it. And he said, the word of God walked on up. <laughs> And folks say, well, he's crazy. Well, not as crazy as you are if you don't believe it. Thirteen, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in their sight. You say, I don't like the way you talk. You'll like it less before we get through. <laughs> Thirteen, neither is there any creature that is not manifest in their sight. Watch it. But all things are naked and open under the eyes of him. Where's the antecedent? The antecedent is in verse 12, the word of God. Naked and open are the eyes of him with whom we have to do. One time a man said to Martin Luther, he said, uh, where is your religion found? And Luther said, where well, yours has never been found and never will be found. And the man said, where? And Luther said, in the Bible, nowhere else. Amen. One time a man said to John Wesley, where was your religion before the Reformation? And he said, where was your face before you washed it? <laughs> Behind the dirt. <laughs> All right, now let's turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Now, Paul's what you call a bibliolater, and that's what scares these college professors so bad. 
And your Greek and Hebrew professor was scared to death somebody would think that they worshiped the Bible. So they tried to make their student worship them. And instead of putting the Bible as the final authority, they corrected the Bible and made you think they were the final authority. Uh, and I'm going to show you what the greatest Christian said about this book. Bibliology never bothered him a bit. Galatians chapter 3, verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith the same of the children of Abraham. Watch it. And the scripture foreseeing, the scripture foreseeing, why a book can't foresee, to foresee is something is attribute of something that's living. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel Abraham, why there were no scriptures when God spoke to Abraham. Did you read back there in Genesis when the Lord spoke to Abraham? Genesis hadn't been written at the time God spoke to Abraham. Moses wrote Genesis about 1500 B.C. Abraham lived back there around 1900 B.C. What do you mean the scripture preached to Abraham? Abraham had no scripture. You know who it was that said to Abraham, In thee shall all nations be blessed? Who said that to him? Why, God said that to him. Paul, aren't you ashamed of yourself putting the word of scripture for God? My, my, Romans 9. Romans 9. That's what scares people, see. They say you worship that book. Well, I don't want to have you misunderstand me. I'm not, uh, I'm not a fanatic on it. I know you can burn this book and you can't burn God. I know God is a spirit. May that worship my spirit and truth. I know you can put ink all over this book and you can't put ink on God. I've got some sense. I mean, I'm not making an idol out of it. But, boy, it sure do get close, don't it? It sure do get close. Have you ever wondered, somebody said, well, what he's talking about there is the originals. Who told you that? You never read that in the Bible. Of course, you ever read in the Bible where somebody said the original said, the original said. Isn't it strange how non-Christian some Christians talk? Here's a man standing up and saying a better translation should be. You didn't learn that from God, and you didn't read it in there. You stand up there and say, it's unfortunate it is this way, and a better ending should be such. Did Paul ever talk like that? Did James ever talk like that? Did John ever talk like that? Did Matthew ever talk like that? Did Mark ever talk like that? Did Luke ever talk like that? Did Moses ever talk like that? Did David ever talk like that? Did Jesus Christ ever talk like that? Then why do you listen to him? You know what I think? I think way down somewhere in that veneer, you've got, you've got a kind of a desire to kind of judge that Bible yourself and be superior to it. And that kind of stuff appeals to you. And that guy gets up there, begin to correct it, begin to correct it. You say, well, I can do that. I can study. I can get the brain to do that. And then I'll be the final judge. See? You never heard a Christian in the New Testament in your life talk that way and say, the original said, the original said. All right, Romans chapter 9. We just got a good start. Romans 9, 17. Romans 9, 17. For the scripture saith to Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I raised thee up. The scripture said to Pharaoh, why in the book of Exodus there were no scriptures around when, when Moses talked with Pharaoh. Moses wrote the book of Exodus years after those events took place, at least shortly after that. The scripture didn't say it to Pharaoh. Who said to Pharaoh, for this purpose have I raised thee up? that I might show my power in thee. Who said that? Why, the Lord said it. Paul's kind of careless, isn't he? The idea of putting the word scripture for the word God, isn't that kind of careless? Must have been a bibliolater. You know, one of my young men I teach over there went downtown one time, got to talk with a fellow from another school, and this fellow said to one of my young men, he said, you're a Ruckmanite. They call them Ruckmanites. <laughs> and this kid said, well, how do you figure? You know, they have a joke over there. They have Pensacola Christian schools over there, you know. Arlen and Becky Horton, they got a big school there and a lot of uh, single teachers there, women teachers. And they call out Horton's harem. <laughs> I mean, the unsaved people. They're joking about it, you know. And they call my school Ruckman's Roost because <laughs> you got a bunch of young men. And they, it's a joke. It's funny. It's a joke. I mean, it's kind of serious. And, um, and over there, my young man was downtown. This young man says, you're a Ruckmanite. He said, you're following a man. He said, who am I following? He said, you're following Ruckman. And this kid said, I'm not following Ruckman. I'm following this book. I believe this book doesn't have a mistake in it. Another kid said, well, I, I believe it has a mistake in it. And my kid said, who taught you that? Yeah. Strange, ain't it? Do you ever notice how these fellows say, you're following a man, you're following a man? Every man that says that's following a man. Isn't that peculiar? 
Listen, I'll tell you, if you can find a mistake in that book, you're not following me, because I don't teach you any mistakes in it. I'll tell you something else, you're not following the Lord. Amen. Any one of you fellows here stand up at night, stand up and tell me that God Almighty, the Holy Spirit, showed you a mistake in that book, that God showed it to me. T you tell me, tell me. I'll see you after service. We'll see whether you made the mistake or the Lord made the mistake. Every time you thought 1 John 5, 7 shouldn't have been in ah, Isaiah's age, contradicting Chronicles and Kings, you got it out of another book, didn't you? Didn't you? Didn't you? Yes, you did. All right, Romans chapter 9, verse 17. For the Scripture saith the Pharaoh, even for the same purpose have I raised thee up. The Scripture foresees, the Scripture raises people up. And Paul used the terms interchangeably. Now, this is a strange book I have in my hand. Let's take it and turn to Luke chapter 17. They say this book is not scientific. They say this book is outdated. It's outmoded. It's archaic. They say it needs to be updated. They say it was written by men who didn't have the scientific worldview and knew nothing about the inductive method. Well, let's see how these men did with the limited knowledge they had. Luke chapter 17, verse 30. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In the day, verse 34, I tell you in that night. Oh, come on, Lord. It can't be day and night at the same time. Verse 30 said, in that day, verse 31, in that day, verse 34, in that night. Well, come on, it can't be day and night at the same time, can it? You say, why, sure. How did Luke know that? People thought the earth was flat for 1400. How do you explain the fact that Luke recorded something there that the scientists didn't know about for 1400? How come he knew it could be day and night at the same time? Did you ever try to explain anything like that? You know who thought it was flat in 1400? The scientists and educators. <laughs> oh, I take your Bible and turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. He not only knew there could be day and night at one time, but whoever Isaiah was, and he lived at least 800 years before Christ, he said this. He said this. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 21. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Hath it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he that sitteth upon the circle, the circle, the circle of the earth. The Bible says the earth is round. You know what the scientists said for 14, 15, 16 centuries? They said it was flat. They said it was square. You said, I didn't show that in Revelation that they stood the four corners of the earth? Sure, the earth has got four corners. Aren't you up on your geography? Haven't you ever read the National Geographic magazine? Shows you that picture of the earth with those four bulges there in it, different places. You're up to date, aren't you? Sure you are. Folks say, well, the Bible, the Bible says it has four corners, north, south, east, and west. You've got four corners and a compass, north, south, east, and west. A fellow said to me one time, the Bible's not scientific. It says the four corners of the earth. I went down by the post office, and I saw a sign there about three years ago for a recruiting for the Marines, and it said, Marines are serving Uncle Sam in the four corners of the earth. Folks are funny, aren't they? The Bible accommodates itself to you so you can understand. Then you say it's not scientific. Then the Bible gets scientific and you say, I can't understand it. <laughs> There's something wrong with man. Did you know that? <laughs> we know what a fellow said to me one time. He said, that Bible says the sun rose and the sun set. He said, now we know the sun doesn't rise, it doesn't set, the earth turns. I said, you got a newspaper on you? He said, yeah, and took it out. I said, what time sunrise? And before he could think, he quoted it to me. <laughs> <laughs> The Naval Air Station said sunrise, sunset. You won't beat the book. You won't beat the book. All right, come back to the left and pick up Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Now, you notice I'm only using one book for what I'm going to show you. We're not going to get any other new version. We'll just stick with the old one right here. Amen. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 6. The wind goeth toward the south and turneth about to the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returns again according to his circuits. But they didn't know that back there in 100, 200, 300, 400 A.D. At 100, 200, 300, 400 B.C., the wind has regular circuits or paths it travels. Ask the areologist out there at the airport. He'll tell you about it. Ecclesiastes 1 7. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. Under the place from whence the rivers come, till they return again. Solomon says the water runs down the ocean, then it goes back up the river and come back down the river, goes up the river, come back down the river. Nobody believes that for years and years and years. And then somebody began to study evaporation, condensation, and somebody said, well, it goes up over the water and blows back over the land, clouds come down that drops. Yeah, but how come Solomon knew it in 1000 B.C.? 
Why is it the scientists always lag 500 to 1,000 years behind the Bible? You'd think they'd get caught up sometime, wouldn't you? For example, if I were to tell you tonight, and I wouldn't think of telling you a thing like this, but uh, if I were to tell you tonight that the way to learn how to make bread is out of snow, you wouldn't take it seriously. And if I were to tell you the best, trans, uh, the best substitution for blood in a human being, if you're trying to make a human being, would be water, you wouldn't take it seriously. And if I were to tell you between here and Alpha Draconis going north is a body of water 15 million times big, big in the Pacific, some of you wouldn't believe me, and you're going to go up through it when you go. And if I were to tell you New Jerusalem was right up there and I could point to within three inches of it from down here, you wouldn't believe me, but that's because you're too scientific. See? And if you get in your Bible, you'd be so far ahead of science they couldn't catch up with you. So I'm not going to tell you about any of those things. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Leviticus chapter 15. Leviticus chapter 15, verse 13. Leviticus 15, verse 13. Leviticus 15, 13. In the dark ages in Europe, when the black plague swept Europe and took off people by the million, and there wasn't enough live people left to bury the dead people, the Jews got through with hardly a casualty, And so they were blamed for the black death. The reason why the Jew got through, one of the reasons he got through was dietary law, and another reason he got through is found here. Leviticus 15, 13. And when he that hath an issue is cleansed of his issue, then he shall number to himself seven days for his cleansing and wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in running water. And it wasn't until late in the 1700s the surgeon and the physicians, or 1800s, learned how to bathe their hands in running water to get the germs off them. The guy was putting his hands down the bowl and washing and down the hand and bowl and washing and the patients were getting gangrene by the score and losing arms and legs and hands and feet in the amputation and somebody said, let the water run over it. And now they wash them in running water. But don't you think that uh, 22 centuries is just a little bit slow? <laughs> As a matter of fact, it's more than that. The passage I'm reading here is 14 centuries before the birth of Christ. It's been 18 after. Let's see, that's only 32 centuries off. You know, if you're a scientist, you're going to have a problem trying to keep up with what's going on. You're allowed to get way out of step. All right, take your Bible and turn to Job chapter 37, verse 7. Job 37, verse 7. Job 37, verse 7. Job was written 1800 B.C., the oldest book in the Bible, written probably before Moses was born. Job 37, verse 7. And I'll begin at verse 6. Job 37, verse 6. He saith to the snow, I'm dealing with snow, Be thou on the earth, likewise to the small rain, to the great rain of his strength. God takes care of snowfall, rainfall. The snow comes down, every snowflake is different. I heard him say in a snowfall of eight or nine feet up there in Canada, you can't even find two of them alike. That's a strange thing. Boy, you know, if you're a Darwinian, you sure have a time of that one, man. I don't know how you get through that. You'd think he'd mess up once, wouldn't you? <laughs> all right, seven. He sealeth up the hand of every man that all men may know his work. How do I know it's God doing the work and not Mother Nature, not Darwin? By my hand. God seals up my hand so I can know his work. How do I know his work? I look at my hand. My fingerprints are not like yours. But just many fingerprints as there are snowflakes. The one that made the snowflakes made my hand. He sealeth up the hand. Like a fellow said one time, he said, my daddy got put in jail for something he didn't do. And they said, what's that? He said, he didn't wipe his fingerprints off the safe. <laughs> <laughs> and then they had some smart aleck, you know, drove the police officers and the sheriffs nuts for about a year, trying to figure it out. He'd open them with his toes. <laughs> but you know, I don't see how in the world a man can believe in, be an evolutionist when he knows that snowflakes come down different and hands come up different. They, they're saying now that even no two set of teeth alike, no bunch of toes alike, here's a bunch of fellows saying all the races are alike. Yeah. Why, the individuals are not even alike, man, let alone the races. Yeah. There are no two individuals even the same. They get this idea, well, it just came from a kind of indiscriminate mongrel mass and just gradually evolved into kind of a spontaneous bursting dust cloud that swirled to the chemicals broke off and all this stuff. Why, well, man, you've got to have faith to believe that nonsense. <laughs> I haven't got that much faith. I never have had very much faith. And I've got a lot. It's a lot easier to just say, well, God did it, than go through that mess. I want to read you one of my favorite poems. You may not appreciate it, but this has always been one of my favorite poems. Upon a rock, yet uncreate, 
amid a chaos incoate, an uncreated being safe. Beneath him rock, above him cloud, and the cloud was rock, and the rock was cloud. The rock then growing soft and warm, the cloud began to take a form, a form chaotic, vast, and vague, which issued in the cosmic egg. Then the being uncreate on the egg did incubate, and thus became the incubator, and of the egg did alligate, and thus became the alligator. <laughs> and the incubator was potentate, but the alligator was potentator. <laughs> Now, you know something? <laughs> to me, that's Darwin. To me, that's Darwin, you see. But the alligator was potentator. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, Psalm 75. Psalm 75, verse 5. Just a few items. We'll just play them. We'll get down to business here in a minute. Psalm 75, 5. 75, 5. Now, I think Brother Roloff gets some sermons out of some of these in here. 75, 5. Lift not up your horn on high. <laughs> And speak not with a stiff neck. I don't know the airplanes have a horn or not. Only airplane story I know is I was, uh, this thing like he flies. A fellow flew me up to Memphis, one of those. It must have been about three weeks ago. We were going along there, and I said, What happens if this motor just stops in the middle of the night? I said, if you just fly in pitch black darkness, and the motor just stops, you can't get it going again. I said, What's the school solution? And he said, Well, Brother Pete, he said, You've got to feather down to 60 mile an hour and turn in the wind. And he said, you start coming down, he said, when you get 80 feet off the ground, you turn your land lights and see how it looks. And he said, if it don't look too good, you turn them back off again. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> All right, 75 5. 75 5. Lift not up your horn and high. Now look at here. Speak not with a stiff neck. You know, isn't a voice instructing the world doesn't know that's good advice? And whoever that fellow was that wrote that, he knew you'd mess up your vocal cords if you spoke with a stiff neck. And if you're going to speak, going to sing, it's got to come from down here, and this thing up here has to be loose. Speak not with a stiff neck. But that people in 1800, 1900 didn't know that. If it had a Bible, it might be able to save the voice. All right, take your Bible and turn to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. <clears throat> Psalm 119, verse 70. Psalm 119, verse 70. <clears throat> Their heart is as fat as grease. Did you ever hear fat around the heart? One time he says over there in Genesis 42, verse 28, that Jacob's heart failed him. Did you ever hear of heart failure? One place over in the psalm he says, Wine for this and oil for this and bread for man's heart. They just find out that vitamin E and that whole wheat bread is doing the good for your heart muscle in about the last 60, 70 years. If they read the Bible, they keep up with things a little better, I think. All right, let's turn to Nahum chapter 2. And when you find Nahum, please raise your hand. <clears throat> raise your hand when you find Nahum. One here, two here, three, four, five. When you find Nahum, raise your hand. All right. Yep, you've all been watching the boob tube again. <laughs> Nahum 2. Fellow said, that the Old Testament or New Testament? <laughs> <clears throat> all right, Nahum 2, verse 3. Nahum 2, verse 3. The shield of his mighty men is made red. The valiant men are in the scarlet. Watch it. The chariots shall be with flaming torches in the day of his preparation. In the day the Lord comes back, or the preparing for his coming, the day of his preparation, the chariot shall be with flaming torches. For the chariot shall rage in the streets. They shall jostle one against another in the broadways. They shall seem like torches. They shall run like the lightnings. What do you suppose that is? <laughs> Could it be any clearer? Somebody says, well, you know, chariots... Yeah, but if the Lord had said Ford V8s and Mustangs and Barracudas, who would have understood it, see? In plain words, when the Lord writes, he writes, any fool can get it. And a fellow said, well, it ought to be up to date. It ought to be scientific. Why, if the Lord said the Bukes are bang against the Chevrolets, who in 1800 could have understood it? Take your Bible and turn to Isaiah. Now, if you think I've stretched that, let's go to Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 5. If you think I've stretched that, make it put on an automobile. Why, let's turn to Isaiah 9. In Isaiah 9, look at verse 5. 
I'm not stretching it. Whoever wrote Nahum and Isaiah knew something that nobody knew in 1900. Isaiah 9, verse 5, speaking of the battle preceding the second coming of Christ. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and garments rolled in blood. But watch it, this, this battle, but this battle shall be with burning and fuel or fire. Fuel. The fuel is fire. You crop down that thing, that ignition goes, no sparks go off those pistons, and the fuel is fire. With fuel of fire. The issue with burning and fuel of fire. How do you explain that? I thought I said just coincidence. We'll see about the coincidences in a while. All right, take your Bible and turn to Job chapter 25, verse 5. Job 25, verse 5. Job 25, 5. Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. It doesn't. Doesn't the song say, shine on, shine on, shine on, harvest moon, that business, you know? Behold, even to the moon, and it shineth not. Does the moon shine, people? No, it reflects light. When did you find that out? They didn't know it in 800. They didn't know it in 900. They didn't know it in 1,000. They didn't know it in 1,100. They didn't know it in 1,200. They didn't know it in 1,300. They didn't know it in 1,400. How come you don't read Job? Job was written 1,800 years B.C. You'd think it'd probably get caught up somewhere, wouldn't you? All right, Job 38. That's why the Bible says, Beware of science falsely so-called. Over there in 1 Timothy 6.20. The gods of this country are sex, money, and education. Job chapter 38. Anytime you take sex, education, or money and put ahead of that book, you're in the wrong pew. Amen. You say Christian education? Yes, sir, Christian education. Sometimes Christian education is not Bible education. Right. Yeah. Fellas, will I be the fundamentals? So did the Council of Nicaea, 325 A.D. So what? So what? You know something? If I had time, I could stand here tonight and take the two Babylons by Hislop and open that thing, and I could show you every fundamental of the Christian faith and practice before Christ was born. And good people, the thing that makes your religion different than other folks' religion is not a number of things you believe out of this thing. The thing that makes sure it's different is you have an authoritative book that you can bet your soul on. And don't make any mistakes. Why, Thomas dies... He's buried. He comes up from the dead. While Apollos, he dies and goes to the underworld and comes back up. Ephesians chapter 4, Matthew chapter 27. Why, well, we got a lot of virgin-born people over there. Isis and Osiris, all kinds of folks. Long before Christ shows up. The thing that makes my religion different from pagan religions is the fact that I've got an authoritative book and I can believe everything in it. See? It's got the truth out of all those places and stuck right here without any error, a mixture of error in it. Job 38, Job 38, Job 38, verse 16. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea? Well, up until about 1850, 1860, somebody said there wasn't any fresh water out in the sea. But the divers went down and found it. Job chapter 38, verse 19. Where is the way where light dwelleth? Why didn't he say, where is the place where light dwelleth? Because nobody has yet been able to locate, locate light as coming from a source. It's always moving. So he said, where is the way? How did Job know light was always moving? Einstein spent a lot of time trying to prove that. Job chapter 38, verse 22. Hast thou entered the treasures of the snow, or hast thou seen the treasures of the hail? A fellow said, that's just figurative. No, it's not. Dr. Shute said there's $8.14 per acre in nitrate, ammonia, and albuminol in a two-foot snowfall. 38.24. By what way is the light parted? By a spectroscope. But who knew that before the time of Christ? Verse 35. Canst thou send lightnings that they may go and say unto thee, Here we are? Ben Franklin did. He got messed around with lightning and a key, and somebody got messed around with electricity, and the old boy picked up the phone and said, here we are. How do you account for that? How do you account for the fact that Job said that lightning could talk? Nobody else knew that. Like an old car boy came on, home one time to his daddy, and he said, Daddy, he said, we used to study the telegraph in the school. Would you please explain the telegraph to me? And his daddy said, well, son, the telegraph is just as if you was have a dog with his tail in New Orleans and his mouth in New York, and you tromp on his tail in New Orleans and he bark in New York. <laughs> that is a telegraph. 
And the boy said, well, thank you there, Pappy. Now, would you please fasciate on the wireless telegraph? And he said, well, he said, the wireless telegraph is, uh, it works on exactly the same principle, except in that case, the dog am imaginary. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Revelation 22. Revelation 22, 19. Revelation 22, 19. Revelation 22, 19, and if any man shall take away from the W-O-R-D-S of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city. If any man shall take away from the W-O-R-D-S, not the message, not the fundamentals, not the, not the truths, the W-O-R-D-S. Let's see if that's a good solid Bible doctrine. Let's turn to John, the Gospel of John. That's the best one for the deity of Christ. John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Somebody said, well, you couldn't have the words in the original because the words in the original are in Greek, and you lose a lot in translation. You mean you lose a lot of the exact uh, force of the original? The fellow says, yes. Maybe the Lord doesn't want to have you have the exact force of the original. Maybe he wants to have you to have the exact force of the English. Did you ever think about that? I told a fellow one time, he said, if I had the originals right here in my pulpit tonight, I wouldn't teach them to you, and I mean it. If I was over there in that room, the Lord, an angel of the Lord came down that room and said, here, uh, Brother Pete, here are the original manuscripts. And you know what I come over, what I teach you when I came over here tonight? Just what I got on the table. The fellow says, ooh. You know why you say ooh? Because you're the idolater. You worship the paper the other things were written on. Yeah, that's it. And listen, a lot of this old superstitious reverence about the original, the original, original, is a cover-up for rejecting what God gave you. Amen. You better watch that stuff. All right, John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 47. John 5, 47. I'll begin at 46. For had ye believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my W? O-R-D-S words. John chapter 3, verse 34. John chapter 3, verse 34. For he whom God has sent speaketh the W-O-R-D-S words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. John chapter 14, verse 23. John chapter 14, verse 23. Now I realize this kind of dull to some of you. I'll tell you why it is. You don't have a proper estimation of the Word. You don't have a proper estimation of the book. You're so soaked and shot through with time and life and look and Saturday Evening Post and Newsweek and the Cane Mutiny and Gone with the Wind, you don't know where you're at just about half the time. And God has put in your lap the greatest book this world has ever seen. And you underestimate it. You underestimate it. John chapter 14. Well, if all the dust was knocked off all the closed Bibles in Florida, there'd be a dust storm and smuggle across. <laughs> John chapter 14, verse 23. Jesus answered and said to me, Watch it. If a man love me, he'll keep my W-O-R-D-S words. You said, I don't think it's that important. All right, let's see where you are. John chapter 8. Let's see if we can get your number. John chapter 8. John chapter 8, verse 47. Have you ever noticed how, how nervous this book makes people? Get out this book, they begin to shift and squirm around, you know, and get restless. You walk through an air terminal, one of these things, boy, and they'll look at you like you were a three-headed monster, man. <laughs> well, I said, how do you know the Bible is the Word of God? By how nervous it makes folks. You know, some of you fellows, when you, when you were about, oh, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 years old, you carried your Bible to public school. Then you got up around junior high and you quit it, didn't you? You know why you quit it? Too much pressure. You know why you had the pressure? Because you had the right book. And I'll tell you, if you tried Life or Look magazine around there, nobody ever bothered you. Or good news for modern man. But you carry on that old black back 66. And... See? All right, John chapter 8, verse 44. Year of your father the devil. Hope that isn't me. You didn't. And the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and both not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own, for he is a lie and the father of it. 
And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convince me of sin? If I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's W-O-R-D-S. You therefore hear them not because you're not a God. Amen. <clears throat> now, you know something? Those verses say if you love the Lord, you're going to keep his words. And if his words aren't available, you don't have any proof you even love him. You reckon the God that inspired that book and gave it was so weak and so in, impotent and so uh, tired out he couldn't preserve it? You're any lost on the way someplace, just gave it up as a bad job? I tell you, if he had power to inspire it, he must have power to preserve it. Amen. The very idea of God Almighty reaching over the bottom of heaven and pulling me out of a dance band and out of a uh, bar room and where I used to hang out and saying, go preach the word, and then couldn't give it to me to preach. Brother, I got it. I got it. I got it. I know where it is. I know where it is. Somebody said, that's a reference to the original. Where would you get the authority for saying that? I read a book one time about how our Bible was inspired and every quotation the guy gave in it, he gave him a King James Bible. Now, that's a weird thing. How do you figure that out? If your proof the original inspired is this, how come you're quoting this? This isn't the original. Folks are funny. All right, now let's take a look at this book. See, thing I got here, mine's a mess, see, I, this is my fifth one, it's about gone now, and I have to keep taping it up, and the thumb wears through it and everything, but this thing here, in, in the original, <laughs> <laughs> it had seven bands around the back, because Revelation chapter 5, verse 1 to 3, says there was a seven-sealed book, sealed with him and thou. All right, now, would everybody in this building please take your Bible and tell me something? Have you got red around here? If you have red around here, let me see your hand. All right? It's a bloody book. So they put red on it. How many of you have a black book on here? Let me see your hand. They say put it down in your little black book. That's the book. All right, how many of you have gold or gilt edges around here? Let me see your hands. Gold covered all the tabernacle furniture. So it's deity. So it's did you see? And you know, back in the old days, when you opened one of these King James Bibles, you'd have a little old thing right here at the front that I got in mind, where when you open it up, there's a book here with seven seals on it. Now, some of you don't have that, but I'll tell you what you got. Anybody down here, hand me a Bible? Hand, how about, hand, I want to write that. That'll do, fine. Here's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines around the back of that Bible. And if you've got five, one, two, three, four, five, you've got six coming across there and seven going across there. How many you got it? Let me see your hands. Now, you're not a quinky dinky huh? <laughs> now, how do you explain that? Well, I'll start with the publisher. The publisher don't even know that. If you went to Oxford and Cambridge and asked those fellows why they did that, they couldn't tell you that. It's a strange book. But the more you study, the stranger it gets. For example, this book here at the beginning of it, it says to the most high and mighty Prince James, defender of the faith. Now, some of you don't have that in your Bible, that dedicatory. You ought to have it, though. To the most high and mighty Prince James, by the grace of God. You know where the word James comes from? Any of you fellows know what the Greek word or the Hebrew word for James is? I mean, it's not an English word. It's Jacob. It's Jacob. God waited you had a king on the English throne and put that thing in there, the most high and mighty Prince Jacob. Why, Jacob was a prince with Israel. This is a Jewish book. Every writer in it is a Jew. He wouldn't turn out a book when Elizabeth was on the throne or George was on the throne. He'd have to get James. Do you ever stop thinking about this? That thing says, King James, nine letters. Holy Bible, nine letters. One, six, one, one, nine. You know what nine is in your Bible? Well, when old Abraham was ninety and nine, he bore that fruit and got that seed. And in the ninth chapter of Genesis, the Lord says, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth with that fruit. And there are nine fruits of the Holy Spirit over there in Galatians, which just by a wild coincidence just happened to be the ninth book in the New Testament. Surely coincidence, nothing to it, nothing to it. But I'll tell you something. 
I'll tell you something. If you want to bear fruit, that's the book to you. Amen. And back in the old days, the fellows preached that book. They thought that was God's word, and they preached it like they thought it was God's word, and they got the fruit. And the Bible says, by their fruit you shall know them. You say, I've got, a, I've got an ASV. What are the fruits? You say, I've got an Amplified. What are the fruits? By their fruits you shall know them. The greatest missionary and evangelistic period church history the world's ever seen was between 1600 and 1900. And that's the book for you. By their fruits you shall know them. Explain this to me. Isaiah has 66 chapters. The Bible has 66 books. In Isaiah there's a division after chapter 39, and it's so obvious anybody can see it. As a matter of fact, the scholars see it so much, they think two different men wrote Isaiah, and they talk about Deutero Isaiah. Or if there's a split in Isaiah after chapter 39, there's a split in the Bible after the 39th book. Tell me something. How did Isaiah know where to divide his book, where the canon was going to be, when the canon wasn't yet complete? A fellow said, well, they fixed that up later. They did. Well, let me ask you this. The first book in the Bible begins, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and Isaiah 1 said, hear, O heavens, and hear, O earth. The last book in the Bible says, I saw a new heavens and new earth. Isaiah 66 says, and I saw a new heaven and new earth. Pretty good guesswork, wouldn't you think? Yeah. Let me ask you this. If they just fixed it up later, how come the first book in the New Testament, the first, the 27, says, Behold the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness? And chapter 4 in Isaiah says, Behold the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. Amen. Pretty good guesswork, wasn't it? And you lay that thing out so the first chapter matches the first book and the last chapter matches the last book and the split in the middle is the right place with the right material on both sides, you're doing pretty good. You're doing pretty good. Considering the fact that the book wasn't yet complete. Somebody said, well, the same thing is also true of the other books. No, it's not. No, it's not. No, it's not. It isn't true of the other books. A Hebrew Old Testament wouldn't have that phenomenon because a Hebrew Old Testament Orthodox Jew doesn't have a New Testament, doesn't have 66 books. Somebody said, well, the King James Bible set up, up its order of books after the Septuagint. No, it didn't. The Septuagint has some apocryphal books in there. But the King James is not laid out according to the Old Testament Hebrew and not according to the Septuagint. What's it laid out after? Good question. Let's see what it's laid out after. All right, you got a Bible there somewhere? Did you ever notice the order of books in your Bible? Take your Bible and turn to Second Chronicles. I'm going like a house on fire. Second Chronicles. Second Chronicles. All right, in Second Chronicles, he says at the end of that chapter, those Jews are in captivity. That kept, kept captivity takes place right there. They go into captivity, he tells them to go back and rebuild. Look at the next book at the Second Chronicles. Next book, Ezra. They go back, the return. Look at the next book, Nehemiah. They rebuild. They rebuild. Look at the next book, Esther. Look at the next book, Job. Look at the next book, Psalms. Shall we try it? Let's try it. Second Chronicles. They go into captivity like they went in 70 A.D. Next book, Ezra. They go back like they went back in 1914. Next book, Nehemiah, they rebuild like they did in 1948. Next book, Esther. Look at Esther. Notice in the first chapter, there's a wedding and a party in the king's garden, seven days and seven nights. Look at the next book, Job. In the book of Job, Job's on the ground seven days and seven nights being persecuted by the devil. You know how many chapters in the book of Job? Forty-two for the great tribulation. Right on the money. Right on the money. You know what happens in the book of Job? The devil persecutes Job, but then that book, the Lord turned the captivity of Job just like you turned the captivity of Israel. That is all. Then that book, old Job gets those kids back, there's a resurrection, just like there's one there. That isn't all. Look at the next book, Psalms. And the book of Psalms up shows David, Christ, Christ the son of David, to reign on this earth. How do you explain that? That isn't the order in the Hebrew text. That isn't the order in the Masoretic text. That isn't the order in the Septuagint. That's from the order that God gave you in this book that's superior to the originals, brother. Amen. That isn't in the originals. That's missing. That's some layout of books you got there, isn't it? Well, I said, if we only had the originals, if you only had the originals, you'd be blind as a bat. You couldn't find out anything. 
All right, now let's take your Bibles. Let's look at it just a little bit further. Take your Bible and turn to Psalm 138. Get that in one hand. And get Psalm 138 in one hand. And get Nehemiah 9 on the other. Psalm 138, one hand. Nehemiah 9 on the other. Old Paul said, I, I believe it shall be even it was as it was said unto me. God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that should he repent, that he should repent. Happy he said, you shall not do it, or happy spoken, you shall not make it good. Somebody said, you're a Bible believer. Yes. You say, you're a Bible fanatic. Yes. That doesn't speak bad of me. That speaks bad of you. You ought to be too. Amen. You say, well, you put that book in too high a place. I don't put it, put it in a high enough place, and I'll show you. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 5. Watch it carefully. Nehemiah 9, 5. Then the Levites, Jeshua and Cadmiel, Benai, Hashabaniah, Sherebiah, Hodijah, Shebaniah, and Pethahiah said, Stand up and bless the Lord your God forever and ever. Watch it. And blessed be thy glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. Blessing here. Praise here. And his name exalted above all blessing and praise that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, every head should bow, every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Psalm 138. Psalm 138, verse 2. Psalm 138, 2. I will worship toward thy holy temple and praise thy name for thy loving kindness and for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy small w word above all thy name. Now, what you going to do with that? Now, you've got a whole generation of Christians that take that, just take that yawning. You don't think anything about it. And if you pray in the name of Jesus and talk about worshiping Jesus, and that book says he's magnified that word above his name, what do you know about that book? If I had you, had you, had you stand up right now and give me four verses of marriage and divorce, could you give them? Some of you have been through it. If I asked you to give me five verses on eating, could you give them to me? They're in there. If I asked you to give three verses on sports, could you find them? Some of you fellows are doing them. Boy, I tell you, man, if you didn't know the devil had this thing under control, you'd know it by that, wouldn't you? Here are a bunch of folks that are saved, profess to believe that book, and God already told you that book is above the name of his son. And what do you do with it? What do you know about it? Nothing. Nothing. Some of you folks had to stand up a night. I wouldn't embarrass you. If you had to stand up a night and give me five verses on making money and saving money, you could do it if your life depended upon it. And you know it. But you make money, you're in business. Well, we've got to close. Psalm 118. Psalm 118. I haven't even had time to talk about what i got on the board yet. Psalm 118. Now the 31,175 verse in the King James 1611 A.V. You know what the middle verse is? Psalm 118, verse 8. The middle verse in the King James Bible says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. All right, count the words. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. You can't get a center word in 14, it's an even number. You've got to get two center words. What are the two center words? The Lord. How do you account for that? There's only one book in the, in the world where the center two words in it are the Lord. There's only one I got up my hand. It's not true of the Greek. It's not true of the Hebrew. You say it's true of the New American Standard Version. No, it's not, because it took out 25 verses. Yeah. Its middle verse wouldn't be Psalm 118, verse 7. What do you make of that? Just show me anything like it. I'll trade it in. <laughs> Just show me any book in the world with 31,000 verses in it. When you bust the thing down in the middle, the center of two words are the Lord. The fellow said it's coincidence. You're out of your mind. You can't do anything like that. You mean tell me those fellows count all that stuff through and count those words out through and then bust the thing down and did that thing on purpose? I don't believe it. I don't believe it. All right, one more shot. First Samuel. First Samuel. I'll talk about this tomorrow night. I'm going to get over brother. We lost time here. Don't want to do it. Turn to First Samuel. Now, I'm going to show you something about you and the Lord and that word. Get First Samuel and pick up First Samuel chapter 3. First Samuel 3. And whenever you hear me say the word, you know what word I'm talking about. I'm talking about this one. 
And like I told you, if I had the original here, I wouldn't fool with it. I wouldn't fool with it. I teach Greek, teach Hebrew. I've got Kittle's Old Testament, Critical Apparatus, Nestle's New Testament, Critical Apparatus. I know about Tischendorf, Sergelis, Rockman, Grease Box, and all that stuff. And if I had that stuff right here in this table, I'd just give you this. This is the bread which the Lord thy God hath given me. All right, First Samuel 3. Wouldn't I be a fool to stand up here and preach that stuff? Imagine a fellow getting out in the street like I do and preaching. I preach out in the street in my hometown. And get up and top that bus and saying, and I want to tell you, in the locket of ending, the circumflex accent is on the anti Glory to God. <laughs> All right, First Samuel three verse one, and the child Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. Watch it, and the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision, hard to get the word. Amos said there's going to be a famine someday. Watch it careful. Verse 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. How come? The word of the Lord was not yet revealed to him. Verse 19. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and he let none of his W-O-R-D-S fall to the ground. Verse 21. And the Lord appeared again in Shiloh, for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And you know why some of you saved people that are saved and going home to heaven don't know the Lord like you should know him? Because you don't know that book like you ought to know that book. And I'll tell you something, when the Lord reveals himself to you, he revealed himself through there. The verse said he did. And when you... Like what old catechism said, ignorance of this book is ignorance of Christ. And I don't make them identical. So I've got better sense than that. But boy, they sure are close, aren't they? I mean, Christ had two natures. So does this. Christ can save you. So can this. Receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. They're both living. They're both loved. They're both hated. They're both incorruptible. They sure are close, aren't they? And I didn't have time to get in this, but I'll save for tomorrow night. Let's have a word of prayer and make way for the roll off. Father, bless your word. We know that your word is settled forever in heaven. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but your word shall not. Father, we have great confidence in thee and in this book. We've seen it work. We know what kind of a book it is. And we know, Heavenly Father, this is the book that's hated and cussed and despised. This is the book that conservatives and fundamentalists sneer at sometimes, right along with papists and atheists and infidels. And we know no book could be hated like this one is and be an ordinary book. Help us to love it. Help us to read it. Help us to learn it. Help us to hide it in our heart. Help us to preach it. Help us to teach it. And, Father, if we have to, help us to die by it. For Jesus' sake, amen.